Roger, thanks so much for that. Uh, yeah, excited to be here. My name is Patrick Sakis, Hill from Atlanta, Georgia currently, a uh, recent transplant from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, as Roger mentioned, I've been with BTS for about uh, seven years now. I started as a contractor, graduated to full-time in early 2016. My background is in IO psychology. I got my master's at the University of Central Florida, and uh, I've been kind of my day-to-day -day is managing a large-scale pre-hire virtual selection assessment for about 4,000 candidates per year. Uh, Jurgen, would you like to say a couple of words? Yeah, well, thank you, Roger, for covering most of it. Um, I did spend five years in Minneapolis and actually working for PDI, helping them with evaluation guides and talent assessment. And um, <clears throat> then it got kind of too much the same and I joined BTS for more excitement. And some of that excitement we want to share today um, because BTS, and maybe we can go forward to, yeah, the overview of BTS slides. So BTS is not the Korean boy band. Um, they came after well, us. I think Alexa. Alexa, who is BTS? BTS, also known as Bang Ten Boys or Beyond the Scene, is a seven-member South Korean boy band formed by Big Hit Entertainment. Hmm. All right, you're not going to get seven members today. <laughs> Just us, Patrick and me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are a uh, <clears throat> global strategy execution consulting firm with uh, 700 professionals worldwide. Our passion is on the people side of strategy, helping leaders at all levels make better decisions, convert those decisions to actions, and deliver results. Our goal is to inspire others and equip people to do the best work of their lives, uh, resulting in better businesses. Okay, I think we can move forward. You have a fresh picture today, much better than that young looking stuff. We have uh, <laughs> three, three agenda points, a quick introduction. I understand we can make a commercial plug if we become sponsors. I felt we don't really need to do that. We, we're happy to be sponsors and um, we didn't pay privately, but, but with our company funds, um, we're happy to sponsor you. We love uh, PSYOP and I love the, the chapter in Minneapolis. Some of it will be a little bit commercial um, in terms of like, we want to share our sparkling objects. We want to share what excites us as we administer the science of psychology to our work and to the service to our clients. But that, that's the extent to the commercial that we'll get. Um, we'll have a breakout group where we reflect a little bit on your experience uh, with reliability and validity in the virtual uh, uh, realm. And then Patrick will talk us through more of the scientific evaluation of what we're actually doing with one of our uh, clients we're most proud of. And this is BTS, overall $180 million globally. We come out of the, the company comes from the leadership development with a focus on business acumen. Um, they don't want to talk about it. BTS is the Behavior Training System acronym inspired by IBM, I believe. <clears throat> After a year, they realized it was a bad uh, company title because it was limiting the, 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 the descri description. The, it was limiting the area where we work at, but the, the three letters stuck, which by the way is, uh, one of the tenets of my career, I only work for companies with three letters like SHL, PDI, BTS, and I want to keep it that way. Out of those 180 million, 18 only go to the assessment practice, which is about 18 years old, which is about 10 years old uh, and grew rapidly in the last seven. Some of you might know Central Hartog and Fenestra that is one company that we kind of incorporated. We 
we want to say we bought them, we did pay for them, but we kind of joined our efforts and became one together. Much, much of the dynamism um, in the assessment space also comes from that root. Leadership is relentlessly contextual. This is our standard slide convincing our clients that off-the-shelf products, solutions that work for many, are probably not the best for you, so that we um, fo and that we really focus on what is specific about the culture, the business situation, the clients, and the maturity of the business that we are working with. catch people in the act of being themselves. That, that's really that tenant um, as psychologists, and that's not news to you. We, we focus on behavior, on observations, on um, evidence of uh, personal capability that we then relate to our clients. I'll share um, three aspects of assessment and what those three projects, three cases have in common. They are all valid, they are all scal scalable, and they face valid. Valid is important for the technical buyer. Face valid is important for everybody else. The first case is an SJT. We developed this situational judgment test based on 30 interviews with the client, understanding this burgeoning high potential role, and then developed in context of this company um, that we virtualized, we changed the name, we alternated a lot of the aspects of it, but we did simulate a large part of their business and we guided the, we guide the participant in an SJT type of environment from moment to moment where they get to share with us how they um, would react in, in that situation. What's different in com comparison to a an SJT that you might have uh, seen in grad school or from a competitor, it's really embedded in a business scenario and in a story. So that, uh, again, face validity needs to be up uh, in, in, in our approach to the market, that participants actually have the feeling they, they grabbed by the context of what we present um, that they get the feedback is actually fun and um, they can be themselves. Again, catch them in the act of being themselves and help them feel as if that is true. Here you see, for example, an illustration of, of an email that comes in. Um, these emails come in uh, spontaneous and you need to open them, respond to them, they are wobblers. Wobblers are sudden interruptions that are coming from an independent timer that participants need to react to in the moment. On the bottom of the screen, you see the bulletin board where um, a distractor, um, uh, fresh information and distracting information uh, alternates and the participant needs to incorporate some of that information in order to navigate through the business case simulation. If I sound a little bit breathless, it resembles the feeling when you go through this. Um, I forgot. Is it 45 minutes? We, you see the timer um, uh, on the screenshot is at 29 minutes, but I think the overall experience is a little bit longer. And you need to pay attention. There is constantly some, uh, hap something happening on the validity and reliability side. The SJT content is as conservative psychologically as you can uh, imagine. 
they are um, professionally constructed situations that, that are embedded into the story and the response options are um, weighted uh, according to the subject matter expert judgments. Yeah, and one note is that I, I really appreciate that we can add the, um, the videos and the audio for uh, the SJT to really set up the situations before asking that, you know, how likely are you to X, Y, Z? So what you're seeing is a screenshot of a uh, audio file, which doesn't work that well. Uh, but it's, um, it's a voicemail that, that the participants receive during the day and they listen to it and then respond to the SJT question. And then we have colorful results. <clears throat> Again, they need to be clear, they need to be expressive. What you see here, this is um, a report for development purposes. So we compare the individual's results uh, to the theoretical 100% perfect and then break out uh, by behavior and by moment where uh, we see an improvement potential and a focus for personal development. A different scenario, so this was an SJT, is our virtual individual assessment that we call Selenica. This was for a large pharma organization who came to us um, I think we can move forward um, with the need for 12 different roles to be assessed. And they were adamant that we basically measure the, um, the performance towards these roles, specifically to those contexts. What was of particular interest is that we had one buyer um, who bought this whole pack, but then we had different <coughs> um, units inside this client who had often different competency models and definitely different requirements for the simulation. So we ended up developing an infrastructure of 12 pharma jobs, which are all embedded in this hypothetical company called Selenica. And for the simulation, because we have we working with pharma in different um, healthcare environments in different co countries, we developed our own country with our own healthcare system, which is a blend between the um, the an American system and a European system, and uh, a more um, a privately funded system. We. We invented our own drugs so that people who come out of a certain drug tradition don't have a comp com uh, competitive advantage like the onc oncology um, or, or whatever the, the, the disease area and this. Actually, we have both. We have our own diseases and our own drug uh, areas. So, and, and once we set up all this, the healthcare, the drugs, the disease areas and the country, uh, we could put uh, all these 12 different roles into that context. I think there's another slide that was illustrating that a little bit more. Oh no, it's not. That's the setup for uh, the participant experience. The participant needs to prepare. They need to learn about our country, uh, their country. They need to learn about their company and their job in that uh, simulated company. And all of that happens before the assessment starts. In this particular <coughs> um, example, the participant also prepares a SWOT analysis for uh, various opportunities in, in their specific, uh, specific uh, simulation and the psychometric testing and the aspiration discussion happen as well before the assessment. Then the day of the assessment, 
you can imagine it like a, a, an assessment center, except everything happens on screen and only between two people interacting. What starts first is an inbox. Uh, we, we're in the process to reviving uh, that part of independent work as the inbox becomes a more and more irrelevant part of our uh, workday. So we, in future versions, we will have a Slack. We're thinking of a chat. We're thinking of um, having to schedule meetings with your own org chart and you need to determine who is, who is in the meeting, who is not in the meeting, and what is the agenda for that. All that happens in, in a time of, of quiet work where um, the um, emails are pouring in uh, from an independent timer. And eventually it's time to have meetings, and those meetings are one-on-one -on -one interactions on Zoom. We can't simulate that on Zoom <laughs> today because Zoom on Zoom is, is not working, we tried it. But it's a very grabbing um, experience where all of a sudden there is a real person on screen and they treat you in role, in character with a regular script. You know, you know how all of that works. And finally there, there's the debrief. And then after the assessment um, follows the feedback, most importantly, feedback to the participant and the development uh, planning. Oh, well, there is the country. So it's Mland with urban city, and the country has its own demographics. Um, and that has uh, the demographics, uh, the, the, the uh, urban and non urban populations, private and public payers, all that has implications for the various roles that we simulate, as, especially in access, in distribution, in production, and in marketing of particular drugs. And here is the th are the three uh, therapeutic areas, chronicology, chrysology, and orphanology. Inside these uh, areas, we have assets, drugs that are in, in, in pipeline, online, uh, or online, um, and Participants <laughs> overwhelmingly tell us face with the D's there that it feels real. It's absolutely real. And people will find them in this org chart with their simulated role. So this is uh, uh, the org chart modified for the franchise head. Um, and it depends on the role where, like what part of the org chart we show. <laughs> Patrick, how am I doing on time? We are great. Uh, yeah, take, take your time with uh, Jeannie. All right. So I now want to share my screen. Share screen. And what I want to share with you is another simulation. It's a business simulation that we developed for a large industrial organ international industrial organization. It's the company, it's, they're incredibly dynamic. Um, the company who, who built the Suez Canal, the company who runs a third of the nuclear power plants in France, uh, more than half of the nuclear power plants in, in Belgium, who had a large gas uh, energy business in the United States. They built a factory to bottle Vouve Clicquot. And as a traditional uh, energy client, energy company, wanted to get out of carbon. And at that moment in history, that was like three years ago, they came to us and said, um, can you build us a simulation for high potentials? Um, and those are people who, who are under a country manager level. 
now and within three years should get to a C level. And in this organization, they probably have 120 C level positions. And the company was extremely diverse, a little bit like, like we had it in pharma where they, we don't want to give anybody a home advantage of, um, of a certain therapeutic area or drug. So we invented business unit 25. The company already had 24 different business units and they were very diverse from building to maintaining to uh, energy supply. And um, what I'm sharing now with you is the experience of a participant coming into our online environment. Um, so I'm set up, that, uh, so we are online. Um, my assessment technically started uh, 15 minutes ago. I'm a little bit late, uh, but that doesn't, shouldn't make a big difference. So first I come in, I get my welcome. Welcome to Genie. That's what we call that company for the simulation. And if we have a lot of time, we could go to the introduction video. That tells, tells you most of what's going on. Can you hear that? Matt will soon be taking part in a development experience. In order to prepare Quiet, but we can hear it. And access to the online portal that includes all the information he needs. This is where he'll find everything he needs to prepare. This is also the portal he will log on to the day of the scheduled event. He is now looking at the information he needs to prepare. He has all the practical information he needs, such as how to use the online portal and where to get support. The event schedule shows how Matt's day will be organized. The More About Genie tab includes the case study. Here, Matt will find everything he needs to know about the company he's going to manage as part of the experience. Preparing this in advance will help Matt execute on his strategy on the day of the scheduled event. On the day of the event, the How to Navigate tab will show Matt how to use the tool. This tab, along with the others, is blocked for now. It will become available on the day of the event. This is all the information Matt needs to prepare for the experience. Matt is going to start his development experience. He booked a time slot a few weeks ago. After completing his pre-work, he is now ready to start. Matt's first step is to manage his business for a first round of decisions. Each decision illustrates a trade-off. Matt will need to think about how these decisions support his strategy. Okay, so we probably can stop here. After managing the business, Matt can I stop here? Yes. Um, stop here and go to this running the business phase. So as the person starts their assessment, you see here in black on top of the screen is the peer meeting. It's still blacked out. It's not available because I'm, as I'm um, being assessed today, I first need to run the business. So I go to the run the business tab and I prepared, I, I know what this is about. Um, so I look here at the screen and see like uh, I can make decisions on where I want to invest or divest. So I need to consider my strategy that I put together um, and say, yeah, I do want to a little bit get out of coal and see as I go down, you see the reaction in the numbers. So I, let's, let's try this. I go significantly out of coal. I keep gas stable and I improve my renewables. Maintenance, now maintenance is important. Um, I do want to make sure even if I divest in coal that the um, equipment doesn't explode or fall apart. And I can scroll down, maintenance, uh, Technology infrastructure for coal, I don't, 
I, I don't invest, I divest, like coal is going to be out. Um, gas I maintain and renewables I amp it up. And you'll see when I commit to these decisions, so, so these are like the, the levers I can pull. Um, as I commit to the decisions, the numbers and the metrics will change and give me some information on how I'm actually doing business-wise. So I commit to these decisions. I, I, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure today. And now I'm confronted with uh, various innovations, uh, initiatives. There is replace the Genius Call Center. Mm, the the project is currently in its feasibility study. I think ah, that's fine that we can just leave it as this, stop the project. And I commit to this decision. Is that right? No, it's not right. I also need to go to the Genie Startup Incubator. That's an organiz organization that galvanizes young talent. I'm a psychologist, I believe in talent. I launched the incubator, I pour some money in it. And like, what's the third? Using blockchain to track green energy consumption. Yeah, let's see, let's, let's push this to the minimal viable product. And um, maybe in, second, in the second round, I can pick that up. So I confirm, to my, conf conf confirm my decisions. Before committing your decisions for innovation, please ensure that you have reviewed every innovation project. We saw that I did do the three innovation products, but I didn't look at the acquisitions. Do you want to research acquisition opportunities? No, I don't want to do this. Submit. Now I can commit. Confirm. Yes. I can look into services. Please let me confirm. What is happening? So that's happening too for participants. Uh, when they don't, we don't let them to make bad decisions. There are more innovations. Ah. No, there are not more innovations. All right, that's what happens too. Uh, it's time to call the help desk and <laughs> see what's <laughs> happening. Um, when I'm done with my round running the business, I will have an opportunity to meet with a peer. With the peer, I need to discuss a complex situation where I need to get some inf information from them and they need to get some information from us. The strategy meeting, um, I need to like tell, defend to my boss what I've been doing uh, in my simulation. And the, the role player who's interacting with me will actually uh, know exactly what I've been doing. And he said, well, so you divested in coal and you invested in renewables but did you make sure that you had enough energy for the markets um, um, that you're providing because you don't want to lose market share in that, in that context? And there are more sophisticated questions that they ask. So that's really how we bring the business to life when we um, simulate with, with our participants. We have the traditional uh, role play, but we embed it in custom development. All right. Um, do you want to bring it back, uh, Patrick? Let's do it. <clears throat> so let's break out into some uh, breakout rooms. We will break out into, let's do rooms of uh, about five or six people a piece, just to make sure there's good conversation. The intent of this breakout session 
is to share with each other your experiences, your concerns, your pain points. Really, what are your difficulties with selection and development assessments, especially in a virtual setting? Uh, like, what have you run across? What, you know, what did the organization have to get through? So, uh, you know, if you need to take a quick break during the breakout room, go for it as well. And uh, we'll return back here at about uh, a minute or two after 20 past. So you should see a note pop up on your Zoom here in just a second. So just uh, click to join the breakout room and it'll take you there. I <clears throat> actually, I don't know what I did to make the recording work, like the, the voice come through, but it probably was the setup that you already set up. I think, uh, so we're still recording. So when this gets uploaded, uh, I believe that this section will still be on there. So just a heads up about yeah. that. Uh, yeah, I wonder if it was the computer audio and you're, so yeah, if you're watching this recording, you might just want to fast forward the next like seven, eight minutes. Uh, but yeah, like it might have been the uh, microphone picking up your computer audio versus the sharing the audio, like the system audio. Okay. So, I mean, you could tell from the quality, it wasn't that great. Yeah. I mean, you could hear it. It was just quiet. I think you can stop the recording. We can just start it again. Then you get two. This is your personal account, so you can't do that. Oh, yeah, I can mental assessments where someone got feedback after each simulation. And it was a measure of, uh, in a sense of learning agility, how well could they incorporate feedback from one simulation and adapt it to the next rather than just you know, a psychometric and that may not be scalable or maybe very expensive to do. But I, I wonder if there's a co component of your uh, elaborate process that, that also allows for that as a way and a way of of actually tracking into that because learning agility increasingly is a is a key measure for for leaders um, uh, now. So I'll just stop with those two that that we discussed in the group. I was breakout group. I was. With. Yeah, great points, Mark. Thanks for sharing. Most we'll certainly cover that first point <clears throat> in the second half of this presentation. The developmental feedback and learning agility. Uh, you know, for, for this journey, it, we don't necessarily go in after the assessment and uh, deploy any solutions there, but it's something that, you know, is always kind of on our mind, like, you know, you're investing all these resources, your L&D team is spending all this time and effort. So, you know, how do you assure your results and make sure that you're getting a, you know, return on investment and that your folks are learning based on these interventions? Uh, so we have time for maybe one other person to share one, maybe two bullet points, uh, any great conversations that you had in your breakout groups about your pain points. I, I'll just, a couple things we talked about in our breakout room one, one was accommodations for disabilities and if it's easier or harder than say the old fashioned paper um, prep material. And the other was, I was curious about what, um, how you built the business model with the inputs and whether that was empirically developed through, or if it was in, more intuitive? I can talk to that. Um, the, the business model is actually modeled after the spreadsheets that we got from the client. So, um, and we come from this tradition of simulating businesses. So, so we do that with 25 senior leaders in the room, uh, or we did that when we had people uh, meeting in fa uh, face to face. And uh, so we took a slice from that uh, for the engagement and the business acumen part of our simulation. And what was the other question, Anna? 
accommodations. about accommodations. Uh, we wondered if um, their, you know, disability accommodations might be easier or har harder with the way this is set up. We went through extreme uh, measures to um, have online accommodations uh, in our next platform, not in this one. Um, uh, we, we were partnering with Microsoft. And so there our platform is now like v for the visually impaired accommodating. It has a lot to do with color, color blindness, so that we can um, assure, like you can actually indicate your specific color blindness and then the blue tones get adjusted online so that you see everything crisp. Um, other accommodations do not occur in my experience in the high potential assessment arena. Um, like when, when we do intelligence testing or cognitive reasoning, there occasionally we have like a dyslexia uh, request, but for the most part accommodations is, it, it's from a practitioner perspective, not, not an issue. For, for middle level and senior leaders. Maybe with the advent or the, the progress of inclusion, we need to rewrite that. But we need to rewrite a lot of things. The selection and inclusion are you know, not always best friends. Yeah, thanks for that, Jurgen. Yeah, and thank you for covering the uh, first two bullets on our agenda. What we'll take a look at now is the science behind the magic, uh, the deep dive into the reliability and validity of virtual individual assessments. So the context for what you're about to see is this is all one program. Uh, it's a nine year history of running this program. We have smoothed out all of the pain points, uh, roughly 4,500 candidates per year in North America, across USA and Canada. It's the day in the life of a consultative sales professional. From the candidate side of things, it's a three and a half hour experience, and it portrays a real day in the life of what the job would look like at about seven months deep into the job. The experience is fully virtual, inboxes, scheduled meetings with assessors where they're, they'll role play uh, potential clients, and also they meet with their um, their direct report, and they have an opportunity to make outbound calls really at any point they'd like to during the day. How this kind of came about, this whole experience, was the business challenge of the client to hire the best, improve, improve employee success. I mean, you can read the rest of these bullet points. There was a need for growth, but there was also high turnover. Uh, attrition in consultative sales is not great. Uh, the client needed more optimal selections and to reduce turnover. Uh, they needed to be able to support their clients. They needed to increase the diversity of their hires. Uh, new hires did not have a realistic expectation of what it would take to be successful in the role. Uh, and they really just needed a better experience. Their experience at the time when um, we developed this simulation didn't get high marks on engagement from their, from their folks. What we met with them, we understood the business need, <clears throat> and we delivered a virtual assessment center. This specific client uh, is only in North America, but we do have assessments like that 10 VDC experience that Jurgen mentioned uh, that are around the globe. Uh, we run them, you know, all hours of the night and day, uh, the same experience using the same evaluation forms. We calibrate across our global teams and make sure that we're assessing the same thing across all of these participants. The only things different in these experiences are the time zones, the local language, and the uh, context knowledge of local culture, which is taken into account. Uh, one funny story about uh, South Korea, we, um, so we actually have a contact us button on the website. And if you click on it, it'll say, if you're looking for the uh, K-pop band, the Bangtan Boys, you've come to the wrong place. We do actually have folks show up at our South uh, Korea offices looking for the boy band. And alas, we are not there. <laughs> <laughs> 
similar to what Jurgen showed earlier, the consultative sales assessment experience is, starts with some pre-work uh, and an orientation video or two. Candidates have about four days with this. They then move into the actual pink boxes here, BTS Red, where they're engaging with the experience. They work on the desktop, they have emails coming in, they have calendar events, uh, they have role plays, they have unexpected incoming calls. Uh, they can make outbound calls to the phone bank and reach a role player at any point that they want to during the day. So since this is a consultative sales role, and we want to see, are these people picking up the phone and actually dialing, which is a critical measure of success for this job. Uh, so we created a phone bank. Uh, these folks have roughly 50 or so leads, prospects, and clients that they can call at any point during the day. At the end of the day, they meet with their performance leader and kind of debrief how the day went. Uh, then the assessor breaks character and really gets a deeper understanding of their motivations and why they chose to do the things that they did during their assessment. Like, why did you prioritize this group over that group? Tell me why you called this person versus that person. At the end of it, uh, roughly an hour after the candidate completes their experience, there is a multi-page report that is available to the client that's pushed out to their applicant tracking system. And the assessor has a conversation with the client and details kind of the highlights, any of the um, you know, yellow or red flags that happened during the day and communicates the overall assessment result back to the client same day. Within the experience in the pre-work materials, candidates get a lot of information. Uh, there's a balance between simplicity and reality in what we give them. It mirrors the client organization, but isn't quite the client organization. And to uh, that comment, Mark, that you had about the, you know, how do you level the playing field? How do you, uh, how do you, you know, kind of test that information processing? The client, one of their hiring pools is career changers. So these folks don't necessarily have a background in consultative sales whatsoever. Uh, they don't really know the sales process model. They don't know really much outside of that they're gonna be picking up the phone and knocking on doors to gain new business. So we give them all that information they need to be successful. Uh, if they review the background information available and really take a deep dive into it and process it, then they are just as likely to be successful as someone who has 15 years experience in consultative sales, but maybe at a different company who did things a little bit differently. So we equip the candidates to you know, be successful if they choose to take that option. Candidates are working from their inbox during the experience. This is kind of their bread and butter throughout the day. They have emails coming in. There's emails that exist when they log into the platform in the first place. They can click over to the additional tabs and see their calendar, see their uh, account management system, review any of the documents that they've been given they can expand the calendar events and get an understanding of like, what exactly will be asked of me during this phone call with a new prospect alongside the phone number that they need to call or the Zoom meeting link, uh, depending on the assessment. My favorite part of this entire experience is the phone bank, the account management system record. So there's about 50 folks that they can call, right? Within the pre-work, they're given all of these folks' information. It's all um, dynamically generated so that the dates make sense given when the candidate goes through. So, you know, we had candidates that assessed in January 2019 and January 2020, and all of the dates are relative to their start time. Uh, so it looks like, you know, the date is recent and it's been recently updated and populated. Within the experience, they, in their pre-work and also within their experience, they can access those 50 or so people. When they have free time during the day, they can pick up the phone, their cell phone, you know, no proprietary system or anything, and you know, call these numbers. Uh, when they call that number to kind of mirror what happens in the real day of the life of a consultative sales professional, about 50% of the people aren't available. 
because not everyone you call is going to actually pick up the phone. <clears throat> that helps to see, are they actually making calls if they've had a string of three calls where the person wasn't available? Are they continuing to make calls? Like, do they have that grit? Do they have that drive necessary to be successful? Uh, or do they give up and just live in their inbox after three not taking calls? We, uh, normally we see candidates call seven or eight folks, but we do occasionally get the um, overachievers who uh, keep our phone bank very busy who make 30 plus calls to the phone bank. So the quality of those calls really vacillates as does the number of calls that they make. If I was a candidate and looking at this information here for Siggy Off, I'd say, hmm, Siggy's a current client. Siggy has 500,000 in investable assets, but Siggy only has 100,000 invested with me at, at this fictitious company. So if I'm reading between the lines of the materials, I might say, all right, this person has 400,000 more dollars that they could invest in my uh, financial services business. So I might call them, you know, build a little bit of rapport, reference our previous notes from calls, and see what it would take for them to bring that other 400,000 over to me. At the end of the experience, they, the client receives, the candidate doesn't, the client receives a uh, report. This is just the first two pages of it that details the candidate's performance against the 11 competencies, their competency model that they've identified, and either significant development need, development need, proficient or strength across the competencies, alongside an overall recommendation of not ready, satisfactory, or strong. The last call that the assessor has for each candidate, and I'm sure Roger could tell you a lot about this, uh, the assessor completes the evaluation creates this customized report, the report sent along to the client, and then the assessor hops on a call with the client to talk through the candidate's performance. So it's a chance to, you know, give that, have that discussion about the performance. You know, keeping assessors aligned, calibrated, and ensuring that evaluations are consistent is the key to a large scale virtual program like this that's been virtual, you know, since its inception. It really does take a village. Uh, four consulting leads, four support specialists, 22 assessors, and 17 additional role players. If I were in your shoes, I would be saying this. How do you ensure reliability? That many assessors, that many role players, that many people involved in the process? Well, the first step is the assessor training rigor. <clears throat> we spend a significant amount of time training up new assessors to make sure that they're well-equipped and ready to go. Each new assessor spends about 25 hours of independent study reviewing all the materials that are available for this assessment, which are copious, uh, from video walkthroughs to the actual documents themselves, to the assessment materials, to the frame of reference behaviors. And then they have a minimum of 35 hours of hands-on experiential learning with a senior assessor or the program manager where they receive personalized feedback and coaching. They slowly start taking one call, then two role plays, then three role plays, until they're leading all the role plays and leading all the scoring. At that point, they're then certified and they're ready to go and assess the loan. We wanted to confirm that this was continuing to work because as you can imagine in a <clears throat> kind of virtual uh, facilitated journey like this that you know, with so many people across so many time zones and areas, like how do you make sure that the scoring is still spot on? Well, we conducted an iterator reliability study. Uh, what we did was uh, have a candidate go through the process. That, that was the easy part with 4,500 a year. And we recorded the conversations with that candidate uh, with their consent. And we then provided assessors with the audio of those calls. All of our assessors completed this study. We also then kind of regenerated that candidate's performance within the platform for each one of our 20 assessors. So if the candidate sent an email, we recreated that for all of our assessors so they would have the same timestamps, the same uh, you know, calls made, the same exact records across the board. 
at that point, we ask them to score that candidate's performance as they would for any other candidate uh, to analyze the consistency of their ratings. We ask them to listen to the audio files one time to emulate kind of a real day in the life of an assessor as best as possible and to, you know, score it as normal. What we found was that there is a 95% agreement among assessors in their overall ratings, which outperforms the published findings. Published findings range from 0.62 to 0.91, and we did pretty good, gotta say. When we added a lead assessor strategy where the program manager uh, got in touch with the assessor, uh, the one in 20, who had a different overall recommendation than the rest, and kind of debrief the results with her, uh, we ended up with 100% agreement. We also examined intra-class correlation coefficients for competency ratings by exercise. Those range from about 0.77 to 0.98. We looked at inter-rater agreement by competency as well. So historically in an assessment center, uh, agreement is defined as multiple assessors scoring within one point plus or minus, not plus and minus of one another. When you define agreement as being plus or minus one point, our results were great. 85% and above, mostly 100%. If you look at agreement and define it as the percent with the exact same rating, we're still in good standing. Uh, one or two exceptions uh, motivate others to action was a, was a bit of a stretch, but overall, solid performance. Uh, and this is on a four point scale. How did we get to these results? Like what led to this? Uh, we believe that using frame of reference behaviors is critical to success in evaluations. We train assessors on frame of reference behaviors. Uh, we use them in training and we strongly insist that assessors use frame of reference behaviors for every single score for every single candidate. We also train assessors to incorporate situational cues in simulations and exercises and train assessors on identifying those cues and the behaviors that follow. Uh, for example, in the conversation that the candidate has with their administrative assistant, where the assessor plays the administrative assistant, uh, we train assessors to listen for instances of the candidate setting expectations. So if they hear that, that's something that they can call out in their rating. It's a very well-defined item to pull out in the evaluations. Uh, lastly, according to the research, all three of these points are, organizations may require individuals to undergo a certification process to become assessors, and that also helps with uh, inter-rater agreement. Uh, you know, as we talked about, there's definitely a long certification process that normally takes about a month and a half to two months for an assessor from uh, recruitment to assessing solo. So that's all well and fine. What's the business impact of this assessment? Uh, the clients performed a couple of longitudinal studies. The 2016 one that they performed found that first year turnover uh, went from 25% to 6% versus comparable markets not using the assessment. Strongly recommended candidates outperform non-assessed candidates in comparable markets by 129% in production. Needless to say, the assessment is really driving results. Recently, uh, in, the, um, in the past month or two, they actually did another four-year longitudinal study. They really like four-year longitudinal studies for some reason. <laughs> so they had another one. Uh, and they, and, and they were really examining all parts of their hiring process to see what can they improve. And they said, you know, what if we just raise the cut score on the assessment? How will that impact everything? Let's take it so that we go from like a 70% pass rate to a 50% pass rate. They ran it by their legal team. They ran it by their data team. They found no adverse impact from raising the cut score and they did so. So that change actually rolled out uh, two or three weeks ago, Lynn Collins has been the uh, senior client relationship manager on this project. She is um, absolutely incredible and also supports the data analytics from the uh, BTS side. She's been involved in this project since the beginning. 
The last slide, before we get into a little Q&A, I did want to share the candidate reactions. So what you're looking at here is the uh, aggregate 2019 candidate reactions across all candidates who took the assessment. My favorite statistic is this. Please rate your level of understanding of the consultative sales position before the assessment and after the assessment. We go from 34% of folks with substantial understanding to 83% with substantial understanding of the position. We go from 12 to 0% with limited understanding and not many with only a moderate understanding. It truly is a realistic job preview. We have candidates called the help desk that Jurgen mentioned saying, I didn't realize that I actually had to make phone calls as part of a sales job. I'm, I'm out of this. I thought I was just going to be, you know, in a back office, like, you know, looking over books and things like I, this is not the job for me. And, you know, they are able to self-select out, which saves the organization a lot of money on training them. And, you know, bad hire costs them roughly 100000 Candidate reactions to the assessment similarly are really high. Uh, candidates have a great impression of the assessment. They'd be proud to join a firm that requires candidates to meet high standards. Uh, it was clear to me the face validity that the assessment was related to the job of a consultative sales professional. Um, I think highly of organizations that use tools like this. Not quite as uh, agreeing, but um, you know, still pretty good results too. 81% uh, with 13% neutral on I had sufficient opportunities to demonstrate my abilities during the assessment. So that is about it. Would love to hear any questions about the um, this assessment in particular, the Innovator Reliability Study, or any um, any of Jurgen's topics as well. Thank you for sharing so thoroughly, John Fennig. Uh, and it's great to get candidate uh, review of the process. Did you ask them whether they thought their results were? an accurate picture of them? Did they weigh in on validity, horse's mouth validity, as Nancy Tippins would call it? So interestingly, the candidates don't actually see their report. Uh -huh. It is shared with their training manager uh, if they choose to use it. Uh, but especially for the not selected folks, um, they uh, they don't see it. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's the legal thing that we, I mean, in, it's, not yeah. unusual to not share results in a selection situation. It, it's extremely rare to do, but it's incredibly powerful. And it's a soapbox I've been on for 20 years. And we debated it at SIOP in DC in terms of candidate experience. The, the positives are an added viewpoint on validity. We believe the candidates know themselves pretty darn well. And uh, so anyway, you might consider uh, that and let legal uh, be the tail of the dog and not the head. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, Jürgen, I think you might be muted. Brilliant idea. Uh, I don't think we have suggested it to the client and then taking it to legal and make them work. I think that's a brilliant idea. I also, I realized I didn't answer uh, the question before from Mark Sokol uh, about like how we do how we deal with this uh, particular need with development in our assessments and no we don't we don't have that in our offering like that we interrupt the the simulation and say now let's talk about assessor and participant in terms of coaching you um, there's two reasons why we don't do this a we have a separate product we, we call it practice with an expert, where we uh, inter intersperse learning units with uh, application units. Uh, and we have a dedicated uh, coaching practice where we basically say like, let the assessment be the assessment. Let's have a joint session, assessor, participant, and coach. And then the participant and the coach can determine what they want to work on. And we get closer to the participant, to their mindset, to their understanding of the issues. And the 
it's basically out of the realm of the assessment and really in, in, in a true uh, growth environment. Thank you, Jürgen. That makes perfect sense. What would be another question you had in context to, to, to Patrick's presentation of this big financial service organization? One thing we ran into um, is people, especially when you go to other countries like India, um, but here too, people just sitting in on the content just so they could learn what's in there so that they can share with all their university friends. Here's what you're gonna find when you take the VTS assessment. Have you seen anything like that? It's funny that you asked that. Uh, you know, I, I've not heard of that exact scenario, um, but there is a very, very uh, ironclad confidentiality agreement that individuals sign before they see any of the content and we routinely take a look at social media to see what is out there. Uh, there was a case where I was engaging with an individual on Reddit, trying to you know, ask him to take down some, some comments that he made on the financial advising subreddit. Um, it, it ended up working out, but you know, if you search for information about the assessment out there, typically the most you'll find is people commenting that the uh, you know, non-disclosure, uh, the, the confidentiality agreement is no joke. Um, you know, there may be cases of that. We have had one or two times where uh, we think a second person was in the same room and providing feedback on the fly to folks. But, uh, you know, we passed that feedback and, you know, what led us to, you know, think that that might be happening to the client and, uh, you know, just let them know, hey, this is, um, this is what's going on. There's also some validation questions within the assessment to make sure that they are who they say they are that are kind of sprung out of left field and that the uh, candidates don't know are coming. Mainly to the f due to the fact that um, we don't do the, the large scale screening with our solutions so that it comes at a relatively high price for the participant to become participant. Um, like in the internal leadership development, I mean, you don't do that. Like, I mean, that's the end of your opportunities in with this client with this employer and yeah like patrick said it's like it takes it usually takes how long eight weeks before people in the application process come to us for the final screen final hurdle in in that process so and in all honesty we don't do large-scale assessments in india so like in different cultures, I do think there are different approaches to how people see <laughs> what, what, what we value as an assessment and maybe it is different. But no, we haven't experienced that. Yeah, it just, it becomes more of an issue with mass testing as opposed to a four hour assessment, right? Yeah. Bill Hansen here. Um, thank you for this presentation. It was very nicely done. Um, I, I especially like the idea of um, uh, building an accurate job preview, uh, particularly in jobs where there's a lot of turnover. It seems to me that a lot of that turnover is simply due to the fact that people don't know what they're getting into and they wind up accepting jobs that really they're not interested in. Um, you know, could save uh, lots of um, time and money on the part of the employer. Has that been your, well, you've got data that suggests, yes, that's your experience, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Question, do you find that because your assessment is virtual, that you have clients who are using your assessment more for virtual jobs, or does it not make a difference? Ah, very good question. Maybe that's true in the future. Um, right now we use virtual for, or like we have been using 
I've been positioning virtual for a uh, scenario where you save on the traveling cost and the expense of shipping people uh, to different locations. Um, and we typically simulate real jobs that are not just, I say real jobs, uh, um, jobs that are, exist in brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. uh, with a trend to virtualizing the workplace, we, I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know. It's like the, the trend is too young for, for me to say, oh, yeah, we, we, um, we now do this more because of that. Um, overall, I want to say people are not alienated with our technology. So like we use Zoom on a regular basis and even those, those gamified or game-like business uh, simulations, they are typically intuitive enough so that the people who we target uh, don't see an issue. Uh, I'm reminded like in the early days of um, in, at SHL, when we came up with the PC-based assessments, there was a mouse tracking exercise, like so that you can do the cognitive reasoning test correctly, like clicking the right buttons. Um, there was an exercise where you could learn how to like move a certain path through an obstacle course with your mouse. It's it, it, by the time I joined the company, that was obsolete. We, people didn't think they needed to practice with a mouse. And I think many of our users find the, the technology environment intuitive, sufficiently intuitive, that they don't have questions. The video helps to, to bring the, the threshold down. But we don't really explain like how to click on things. I mean, that's just happening and people figure it out. I imagine you'd find an, an age bias. Uh, we dealt with that and, you know, 20 years ago, it's got to be still here. Where young people that grew up with it are much more comfortable. Yeah, they're catching on with technology. They're catching up to us older people for sure. <laughs> <laughs> It's like the Reagan line. I wouldn't want to, you know, talk about your lack of experience. Right? Again, <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other last minute questions? We got about two minutes left, and uh, yeah, really thank everyone for your time and attention. This is uh, this has been a lot of fun. Wish I could be there, and I wish Eric and I both could be there in person. Um, never visited, but uh, maybe I'll see some of you around at PSYOP. I do have uh, one last question. I think we're going to make this a trend this year to finish off for our speakers. What advice would you have for students or early career professionals trying to break out into the IO industry? Big question. Two minutes, go. Jurgen, <laughs> uh -huh. you want to take that one first? I don't know. <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's true. Everything you learn in grad school is relevant to be, to create meaning in the workplace. And my main point, face validity is king. It's like, if you don't have the face validity, um, nobody cares about real validity or reliability because they say that's like, it doesn't, I can't relate it to the people around me. Might be different at PepsiCo when you have like a chief officer being IO psychologist, but in the most, in most places, um, validity and like the, the trust into the data that you provide to the client and selling that to the client by making it obvious that it's true, um, go hand in hand. Networking is king uh, and queen. You know, those relationships in grad school, looking back, I wish that I would have uh, put more attention and focus into really developing those and nurturing those as I, you know, 
entered the workforce and, and, and the years later. It's nice seeing those folks at SIOP nowadays, but uh, I, I think there could have been a lot of different opportunities, a lot of interesting research, a lot of great conversations that, um, you know, and I, I didn't take the time to necessarily pick up the phone, you know, and just reach out to those people every once in a while to uh, keep that relationship going. So that's, that's what I would tell myself eight years ago. Well, thank you so much, guys. Uh, awesome presentation. Patrick, I love how your background looks like a graph. You, you live and breathe measurement, don't you? <laughs> if only it was real. <laughs> gotcha.